now like to take some questions from the audience. If you would, give us your name. And if you have any particular association that would be important for us to know, for example, if you uh, have a question for Holger about Airbus and you happen to be working for Boeing, Boeing please tell us that. Um, and I'll start right here. I'm Mathilde Pack. I'm an economist at the OECD, working on the Korea Sweden desk. I have a question for Mr. Barrault regarding uh, his comment on the, uh, the knowledge availability on internet. Completely agree with you. I mean, when I compare uh, my very first uh, presentation and when I was a young student and right now, I mean, there's a big, a big gap. But this requires to have the digi digital skills. And for that, we have a big gap between the young generation and the elderly. Uh, in the case of Korea, which is a really high technology society, we have uh, the young generation which has almost no problem of basic skills, why the elderly do. So what would you suggest so that the whole population can benefit, make the most of uh, technology changes, while also be aware of the dangers that M Mrs. Liuto uh, raised? Uh, what would you recommend? And I know that in that matter, we all will often uh, recommend lifelong learning. And in that case, how should it be done? Should, be, should the government centralize uh, and uh, take care of lifelong learning? Or should it be taken care of the level of firms? And if so, how would firms get the right incentive to promote this life learning? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> it's a very uh, good and interesting question. Uh, one of the obsession right now re regarding uh, the proliferation of data is what I call digital inclusion. Uh, as you remember, when a few years ago you have access to uh, limited data, now it's huge and huge. Data without correlation or no meanings has zero effect. Now technology can help as well. Um, imagine you are on vacation um, with uh, 25 people in a big uh, big home in the south of France, and every morning you, you, uh, you have a, a room full of socks, uh, pants, trousers, and whatever. Those are the data, okay? If somebody who has no knowledge how to put things together in a house, like me as an example, I will be totally lost. Now the new algorithm will put information together, socks with socks, with age, with family, and whatever. So. Um, the, the, the next generation algorithm, algorithm are creating correlation with data you know, that means sense to the person. Think about you know, the, uh, all the clothes um, uh, in a room. And all, most of the leaders in the digital technology have, again, an obsession, uh, which is to make data relevant to people or, or to, some, or to, uh, or to uh, communities and the next generation uh, algorithm uh, does that. There is a huge effort right now in countries, cities, to bring technology to people. Because before, you had to go to technology. Uh, and I'm very confident that it will help the older generation to have access to this uh, fantastic uh, uh, tool. Well said, Francois. The next hand I saw was over here. Wait for the mic, please. My name is Stanislas Gozon, Capgemini. Question to you, Holger. Uh, I was intrigued by this question of security versus freedom. And the example you gave of crossing roads and automatic, automat, autonomous vehicles and the behavior of people, I thought this is a profound situation. I mean, it's, it's telling. And my question to you would be, what is the role of education in helping people learn how to behave as free citizens in our civilization, in the new world of new technologies? Well, education is, of course, the key. And I wish everybody would be well educated, has good manners, behave nicely. But of course, human beings often don't. And, and this is the question how then we deal with those who don't. Because, you know, we usually say, well, at, for instance, at the end of the day, um, the computers need to be controlled by the human being. I say by Mr. Hitler, by Mr. Stalin, by Mr. Mao, by Mr. Pol Pot. No, no, only by good guys. But, but who's that? Who defines that? That's, that's the problem. 
And of course, if we say, well, this is something, uh, you know, how human beings should, should inter interact. Well, if you look at the social structure of, of street gangs in Los Angeles or Mexico City, you would see this is a different behavior than we all have here. So yes, education, it would be great if this works and if we have only good people, you know, so to speak. But um, there, are, there are bad guys out there for whatever reason and we have to somehow deal with this or with people who misbehave and all that. And a state that comes up with the rules but doesn't care about rule enforcement or law enforcement undermines um, the respect for law, which is a problem. And I want you know, the local communities, if you wish, to discuss, well, should we have a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour in front of a school? And if the people say, by huge majority, yes, that's a good idea to protect our children, then I don't want people to speed there. So either you may pin come up with a rule there, and then you have radar checks, and you make sure the people behave, or you don't care and undermine the whole respect for law. I wish everybody would respect 30 anyway, but we know how few people do if you don't have checks. Susan, you had a one finger. Uh... No, I just address this um, very important question as well. There's a lot that we don't know about behavior. So for example, if you have a bot babysitter, is it okay to be insulting in front of your child to the bot? I mean, after all, it's a machine. Are we gonna be educating children to be disrespectful to Siri or Amazon Alexa, even though we tell them that they should be respectful to adults? So these blurred boundaries of behavior with machines are quite complicated. Um, and, you know, as was just said, uh, who, who gets to decide in terms of the programming of these machines? There was a, an incident many of you may have seen a couple of years ago with a Microsoft bot called Tay that was put out a bit too early and started spouting incredibly racist and anti-Semitic uh, remarks. And Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, promptly, uh, you know, withdrew Tay and, and fixed the problem. Um, but the reality is that many stakeholders have a say in behavior these days in ways that are unprecedented, and I think we need to watch that very carefully. Well, how scary is that? We now have about 15 minutes left, so I encourage both speakers and the questioners in the audience to be very succinct. We'll come down here. The next hand I saw was here. Monsieur Laïchoubi, ancien ministre, politologue. Je voudrais suggérer euh, l'élargissement du spectre du, du débat avec une question essentielle de rapport euh, entre science et éthique. Nous avons eu deux grandes phases. La première phase avec Newton, Laplace, Maxwell. Se chauffer, se soigner, euh, voyager, communiquer. Puis les années 30, on a eu euh, les, une poussée exponentielle des technologies avec euh, des dérives, le plutonium, Bhopal, euh, le sang contaminé, Tchernobyl, des grandes désillusions. Et puis, on peut additionner, vous l'avez évoqué, les grandes compétitions géopolitiques, où les uns et les autres considèrent que les nouvelles technologies leur assurent la, la, la prééminence. 61 euh, académies des sciences européennes, réunies à la commémoration des 350 euh, années de l'Académie des sciences euh, françaises, ont estimé qu'il y a une, un risque de rupture entre la science et la, et la société. Alors, euh, la question, bien sûr, c'est, on revient à la question de l'éthique, à quelle stratégie de recherche, quand on sait que les Japonais ont décidé d'inverser totalement leur recherche, de la mettre à la disposition du besoin social. Alors, est-ce que nous sommes tous concernés par euh, certains types, un angle géopolitique euh, exacerbée, est-ce que cela nous concerne la suprématie d'un tel sur l'autre Est-ce que l'humanité n'a pas besoin de notre débat Merci. François, would you take a crack at that euh, Je vais répondre en français à monsieur le ministre. En fait, j'en ai un petit peu parlé, dans le type de, de projet technologique, il y a deux types de progrès. Il y a le progrès encadré, vous avez cité toutes les révolutions industrielles avec d'ailleurs des, des cycles de Schumpeter euh, très très longs. Et en fait, on a euh, la science cadrée, a mis en place un process, un framework euh, qui permettait euh, de faire progresser l'humanité. Et puis un jour, Internet est arrivé, le smartphone, etc. 
Et on a transféré cette puissance de feu à l'individu. Euh, et je l'ai dit déjà hier, euh, plusieurs fois à la conférence, Internet a été la plus grosse révolution industrielle en termes de création de valeur, sans aucune gouvernance. Au début, Internet était euh, un outil de communication entre A et B, les universités, et devenu euh, un outil de communication entre des personnes. Euh, les SMS, on refait juste un peu d'histoire, au début, c'était un 911, c'est-à-dire un, un numéro d'urgence de, de, au Japon, qui a été détourné par les adolescents japonais, qui sont très timides, et ils ont utilisé donc ces... ces, ces il y avait 300 caractères, à faire une sorte de, de, de jeu de séduction, etc. Et là où, où le bas blesse, où là c'est à la fois inquiétant et fascinant, c'est que quand vous donnez un outil euh, à des individus, où vous le contrôlez, débrouillez-vous, vous ne savez pas où ça va. On a eu le printemps arabe, euh, on a eu les gilets jaunes, qui sont des nouvelles formes de démocratie. Je ne discute pas le, le bien ou le, le, le bien fondé, mais euh, ça a complètement échappé au système organisé régalien qui encadre. Donc, euh, par rapport à ce que vous, ce que vous dites, c'est qu'il y a une ambivalence, c'est-à-dire que soit on continue à cadrer le progrès, ce qui a toujours été fait dans les machines, soit on donne aux, aux, aux citoyens des outils pour qu'ils se développent, communiquent, et là, finalement, on ne sait pas comment ça va, puisqu'il n'y a pas de gouvernance Internet. Hein. Euh, que vous gagnez 100 millions de dollars sur une transaction, vous demandez l'heure, il n'y a pas de... On ne réinjecte pas la création, la création de valeur euh, là-dedans. C'est pour ça qu'il y a des dérives, absolument, euh, et qu'il convient de les encadrer, mais chaque fois qu'on va encadrer quelque chose qui ne l'a pas été, on va nous traiter de rétrograde ou de, de personnes euh, conservateurs. John Sawyers has a chip shot on this. Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, come in on this point, because I, I didn't mention much about the Europe, Europe's role on, on this. There is certainly some very interesting and important technology development taking place in Europe, although we are falling behind both the United States and China in terms of both um, uh, 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 basic research and how we exploit that at the corporate level. But I think the European Union has an important um, regulatory role here. I, I, I implied a reference to the um, uh, 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 general uh, data privacy, GDPR, uh, regulation that Europe pushed through a couple of years ago, which is now a global standard. Uh, uh, we're seeing now the work of the European Commission on the taxation of global corporates in the technology sector. And I think this will also become a global standard, even though Washington is kicking and screaming uh, about it. Um, the, uh, there is a certain role here in terms of regulating this rather wild world where Europe can play a role, but we, I think in order to have that influence, we will also need to invest more um, uh, in basic research and building up our corporates in order in enabling the, uh, the uh, uh, areas where Europe does have an edge, and aerospace and, uh, and so on is certainly one of those, um, uh, uh, in the years to come. So, the, 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 in many ways, the biggest challenge that regulators will face over the coming generation is how we transfer the rule of law we have in the physical world into the virtual world. And I think there's an important leadership role that Europe can take in this. Kicking and screaming is the order of the day in Washington now, John. Johnny, if you had a brief, brief remark. Yes, but I agree, because uh, when uh, we hear that uh, the US and China are the first and that Europe is behind them, I don't agree, because uh, there are numerous fields where uh, Europe is number one, and uh, what is uh, really uh, of interest is that uh, we have uh, less money, it's obvious, and uh, we have also uh, real uh, capability to organize and to cooperate, because uh, when Europe works uh, in Brussels or in other intergovernmental agencies, you have uh, 20, 25 countries working together, and uh, in my opinion, it's a real asset of Europe. Afterwards, for instance, in space, uh, when uh, I see my uh, China counterpart, he tells me, how many are you in CNES? I answer, uh, 2,500. He laughs, and uh, I ask him, uh, how many are you in China? 110,000. But okay, we are 60, 67 million in France and 1.6 billion in China. But in spite of that, uh, on many fields, we are at the same position as that in China. And so we don't have to be shy because uh, Europe is today uh, at the front side in uh, research and technology. 
I have a series of uh, hands in the front row. Jim, uh, Jim may I just add one point, please? Yes, please. Um, I mean, of course, uh, Russia sometimes is geopolitically uh, a difficult partner to handle for Europe, but the true competitors are indeed China and the US, of course. But you know that Europe can do something. You see, if I may, with my own company. In the 60s, nobody would have believed that Airbus could ever compete with Boeing and see where we are now. So if Europe wants to get its act together, it can do so. Okay. Go to Carl Kaiser in the front row. And we'll stay in the front row for the next two questions. Carl Kaiser, Harvard Kennedy School. I have a question for John Sorgis. John, toward the end, you seem to suggest there's a difference between autocratic regimes and democracies when it comes to cyber threats. Democracies, they, uh, for example, their, cap, their, their banking sector can collapse or their grid, whereas in autocratic systems, the regime is at a, ch at a, a, a threat. But couldn't you also argue that democracies also have a regime problem? Some could argue that Putin put their man into the White House, mm. destabilizing the United States, indeed the Western liberal order. So democracies are also threatened as regimes through cyber. Is there any difference here? Well, I, I, I think there is a difference because there are more checks and balances uh, in uh, democratic systems than there are in autocratic systems. Um, I think one of uh, the uh, 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 driving concerns of President Putin is that the Russian system has totally collapsed twice in recent historical memory, in 1917 and in 1991. Uh, and the reason he's so fearful of things like the, uh, the, the colored revolutions and what happened in Ukraine in, in uh, 2014 um, is that he fears uh, a, a third collapse of the Russian system and will do everything he can to prevent it, and so far quite, uh, quite skillfully uh, and ruthlessly. Um, I think in the West, we do have more checks and balances than that. I mean, the, um, uh, uh, the American system and the British system in different ways are both going through uh, a populist moment, a period of crisis, but our fundamental structures of the system are not, at, uh, are not in jeopardy. We're not about to collapse as a society. And one of the reassuring aspects of, we'll talk about Trump on a panel tomorrow, um, uh, one of the reassuring aspects about America's response to a, uh, uh, a character like Donald Trump in the White House is that the system, by and large, is holding up, um, uh, despite, the, uh, despite the strains and the, and the cracks within it. I mean, I, I, I do think it's interesting that uh, the most aggressive users of cyber in a state-to-state -state level have been countries like um, uh, uh, Russia, against the former Soviet Union countries, uh, Israel against Iran, and Iran in retaliation, uh, and to some extent North Korea as a way of sort of uh, trying to get some money, some rent seeking out of the international system. Um, it's, it's striking that uh, although China has used cyber very extensively for um, intellectual property theft, um, uh, and of course there was a famous uh, uh, stealing of the uh, Office of Personnel Management records in the United States, the, the using it as a weapon of war, both China and the United States and European powers have been very reserved about how you use that because, in part, because of the threat of retaliation um, and vulnerability, which I think, as I say, all powers face. But I think I would still say autocratic countries have that much extra vulnerability because they don't have any checks and balances. They de basically don't have uh, broad systems of consent uh, so the stakes are even higher for autocracies than they are for democracies. John, in uh, this phase, the system is not only standing up in Washington, it is fighting back. But about, more about that tomorrow. Right. I saw a prime ministerial hand down here. No? All right. Um, yes. Daniel Dayan of the Romanian Central Bank. Um, checks and balances, they are essential for democracy. And, and we see quite clearly, it's not only that it wasn't the case of Nixon now in, in, the, in this case. But let me ask you, checks and balances are not sufficient. If, if the political establishment is estranged from the ordinary citizen, okay, then uh, we, we, we get into trouble. And this is a big, big issue. 
in the liberal democracies. Now, secondly, it seems like, and, 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 and you, you have not alluded to, but it's clear that we are moving into a block-based uh, global global system. I shouldn't call it a system. It's not a system, and, and this is this is very unnerving. What kind of an order? Geopolitics, security concerns, clearly. The U.S. versus China, but there are global public goods which have to be provided. Uh, it's about climate change, dealing with machines. Some of them may be turned into very obnoxious beings. So there should be a global order. And, and what should be done? What should be done? At the end of the day, it may have, the United States may have to strike a deal with China. I mean, it's, <laughs> however, let's say, unpalatable it may look like. I'm asking you because you, well, it, it, I, I'm not sure this has much to do with the topic of the panel. Uh, we can talk about this in other sessions. I just make two points. Um, uh, first of all, the populist moment that Europe, continental Europe, uh, Britain, and America is currently going through is partly a correction of elites having become out of touch with ordinary sentiment. It's a violent correction, and it's having some very unwelcome uh, consequences, not least for my country. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, there is a sense of um, uh, ordinary citizens reasserting themselves uh, and, and uh, uh, the conventional leaderships of the elite are having to make uh, corrections, uh, both in terms of uh, wealth distribution, in terms of power, in terms of responding to the concerns of people who feel excluded uh, from democracy, and that's what we're seeing now. It's painful, and some of it is very negative, but nonetheless, I think that's basically what's happening. At a global level, I entirely agree uh, with you that we need some global commons. We need some a means to develop global public goods, um, uh, and that's, that was the triumph of the post-1945 world, was that under American leadership, with strong European support, uh, we created a system which did deliver on that. It is now um, in really struggling, and I think your reference to climate change is exactly right. The capacity to address climate change problems um, uh, uh, has sharply reduced because the United States and China, in separate ways, have both distanced themselves uh, from, uh, from the Paris goals and are, are, are going in their own direction. We, we will have to rebuild this. I'm frankly not optimistic that things are going to change uh, in a year's time, but we will, uh, we will discuss that tomorrow. I have just gotten the hook from Pierre de Montbrial, meaning we're out of time and I dare not risk his wrath. So we will wind up here with thanks to you, uh, a very well-informed and uh, timely audience. Thanks so much and to the panel. <laughs> <laughs>